Good morning, everyone. It is great to have you in the house of the Lord. Uh, those that have braved the snow, I know the roads were not the greatest this morning. So those of you uh, that traveled, we prayed for traveling mercies this morning when we were practicing. And uh, if we get snowed in, we already have a plan. So uh, we're raiding the food pantry and uh, Ken, uh, not Ken Minio, Ken Cather's uh, gonna cook. So, and Claire, and, and, Claire <laughs> and, and, Elda, and Elda can help, and so. So we have it all planned out, so if we get snowed in, I, I, don't, I don't think we will. So, but let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you have brought us to this place today to worship you, to exalt you, to lift you up. We just invite your presence into this place that you lead and guide by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would be uplifted and transformed today by the preaching of your word, the teaching of your word, and just the reading of your word, Lord, and, and the singing of, of praises to you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get started, uh, we're going to, I love singing scripture, and uh, this one song that we're going to be doing is out of this. Psalm 100, it says, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. Amen. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Just that passage is all the reason to give thanks. Amen. So, and then uh, Psalm 118. If you if you get a chance today, read Psalm 118. We do a lot of songs written out of Psalm 118 because it starts, "Give thanks to the Lord for He is good; His love endures forever." Let Israel say, his love endures forever. It goes on, it repeats, his love endures forever. We do a song, his love <laughs> endures forever, amen. But the verse that I wanted to, to hone in on was verse 24, that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That's a choice. Every day we get up, we have a choice of whether we're going to rejoice and worship the Lord or not to. So, but as we sing today, we want to worship the Lord. If you're able to stand with us as we enter his gates. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad, I will rejoice for he has made me glad, he has made me glad, he has made me glad, I will rejoice for he has made me glad, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart, I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad, 
Some of you are here, some of you are just wandering. So, didn't I just say it was a choice? We have to choose to rejoice in the Lord. We have to choose to worship him, amen? So, and I like clapping. You see throughout scripture, clapping is one of the ways to worship the Lord. And it is permissible in church. I know some of you were raised in churches where you had to be very solemn, where you couldn't clap. If you read scripture, the book of Revelations, if you want to be solemn and somber, you're not going to like heaven at all. Because there is such a great multitude, the noise of praise and worship to God is unfathomable. So, But we want to go ahead and sing, this is the day. And if you feel comfortable clapping, let's clap. This is the day. you glad today we know soon and very soon we're going to see the king hallelujah i'm looking forward to that day soon and very soon we are going to see the king soon and very soon we are going to that? It Amen. could be today. You realize that. It could be today. Amen. You may be seated. What a great set of opening worship songs to lead us in worship this morning. I have a few things I need to announce, then we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. A few important things to announce. Uh, tomorrow night, keep in prayer. Our administrative council and elders are meeting. So if you're an elder, the meeting is at 5.30 if you are on any of the ministry teams, that means you are on the council, and that means at 7 o'clock p.m. tomorrow night, the ministry teams, a church, uh, uh, Outreach, Christian Ed, Stewardship, Spiritual Life, should be meeting at 6.30 p.m. Please keep us in prayer as we meet. Even if you're not on council or an elder, I would encourage you to set a little alarm on your phone for 7 o'clock and pray for the leaders. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit as a church, so please keep us in prayer. Next announcement, there is a card 
uh, to sign for Walt Kapler. That's Wendy Coy's father. You know, Wendy Coy's mother had passed away, gone home to be with, with the Lord in heaven uh, three or so weeks ago. And so we have a card as you exit the sanctuary to your left uh, for Walt, and we would like to sign that and send that to Walt to, to help support and encourage him and let him know we're praying for him. So please sign that card if you will. And then the other thing, and this is very, very, very important as well. Oh, wait, two more very important. I, I want to hope that you'll remember these. I, I was told if you'll make one announcement, they'll remember one. If you make two announcements, they'll remember one. If you make three announcements, they'll remember none. But we're going to be the exception today. Remember all of these. And I'm sure you remember this next one because it concerns money. Um, there are tax statements out on the table in the narthex as you X on the right. If you've given to the church, pick those up. It's your tax statement for your taxes. Even if you only gave to a special a special project or just to VBS or something like that, you still have a tax statement. No matter how much you gave, you have a tax statement. And so we're going to put those out today and next week, and then we'll mail them to those that had not been picked up. So please pick those up as you exit. And then my fourth announcement, which you will remember, there will be a quiz later on, uh, January 29th. That's this coming Saturday. Unbelievable, but it's here. Uh, we are going to have a special vision meeting a special vision meeting from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. It's only two hours. This is especially for elders and administrative council. Uh, We really expect elders and administrative council to all be present for this meeting, any staff be present. But we would really like it if more of the congregation attended. This is open to everyone, and everyone is encouraged to attend. So even if you're not a leader, even if you're not a church member, please come, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., up in the fellowship hall. We've had those before, these before, where I usually they're more of a brainstorming session. I like to present ideas and hear from those that attend their, you know, their response, what they think, and things like that. This one's a little bit different. Um, we haven't been able to have one because uh, COVID-19 has in- interrupted them the last two years. I, I, I want to have them once a year, really. This one's more of a regrouping meeting where I am going to present a few new ideas. Um, we have a church growth task force. And please keep us in prayer. The Church Growth Task Force is not simply thinking of one or two new ministry ideas. No, that, you know, outreach could do that. Spiritual life could do that. The Church Growth Task Force is really studying culture, spending time in prayer, reading books about church growth. We have to reach the millennials. When I say millennials, I think most of you are thinking of the college students. College students are not millennials. Millennials are 35 years old now, 40 years old now, even 41, depending on what study you read. Uh, you know, the, the college students are Gen Z. We have to reach millennials. We have to reach Gen Z. We have to reach the next generation uh, with the gospel. I am praying that God gives us a burden for the gospel, that God leads the unchurched non-Christians to church, and God leads us to the people. We cannot expect they're just going to come to us. And Jesus never told us when they come to you. Jesus told us to go to them, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. So we are going to talk a little bit about that uh, to lead off our meeting. Acts 4.13. I'm sure you know exactly what Acts 4.13 says. But in case you don't, I'm just kidding, you don't. Some of you might. Tim probably does. He has an amazing brain. Um, Acts 4.13 is after Peter and John are thrown in jail for healing a lame man. They're thrown in jail They're thrown in jail overnight. The next day, they're trying these men, and they look at Peter and John, and they look at them, and they say, they are untrained, ordinary men, but they had been with Jesus. That is cool. They had untrained, ordinary men. Now, in a way, they were trained. They were trained by Jesus for three years, and that's what they say. They had been with Jesus. And I'm going to lead off our meeting talking about that because we need to be with Jesus. And we're going to wrap up our meeting uh, introducing a new prayer ministry and, uh, where it's, it's not just prayer meetings, though they're important. It's really prayer, prayer groups of twos and threes for 100 days, 100 days of prayer. You sh- we should not launch any new ministry, do anything new until it's bathed, 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 and saturated in prayer. So please come for that. Also, um, Ed Walsh is our director of church health and finance for the denomination. He's going to speak to us about a church health assessment as well as... Um, 
well, it's a church health survey and then a church assessment. They're two different things. And he's going to have some great things to share. And I'm also going to share about the purpose of the church growth task force, what we're doing. They will be there to support it and, and hopefully add to some of what I share. So please, this is open to everyone, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., hopefully, especially the elders and council, but any one of you can come and attend and is encouraged to. That, um, so when you, we review the announcements later, that, that January 29th announcement will be on the test. So the other thing, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to pray for the offering. Bill Rotar told me of one of their prayer requests to lift up. Uh, one of his friends, Pat, a is it Amer or Amer? Amer, uh, her son, was found dead on the floor last night. So I'm going to lift up Pat, um, Amer, and family as we pray. We're going to keep in prayer the rest of our church family. Adrian Wall was able to have his uh, chemo treatment last Tuesday, and that's good. I think he has one more this coming Tuesday, so keep Adrian in prayer. We want to continue to keep Diane Young in prayer. She's still, you know, not, not feeling super well. Um, and also, it's her birthday. I hope I'm allowed to announce that. So if you know her phone number, text her and say happy birthday. Uh, give her a phone call, whatever. But keep Diane Young in prayer. And there's many other prayer needs within the congregation. And um, so let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. And Lord, I pray for our leaders at Bethel. I pray for tomorrow night's meeting, administrative council and elders and ministry teams. May we truly be led by the Spirit. Someday, Lord God, I pray that others be able to say the same thing of us, that we had been with you, that, we've been, that, that, that we had been with Jesus. As John 15, 5 says, apart from you, we can do nothing. Apart from you, we can do nothing. As Exodus 32 and 33 shares, Moses said, if you don't go, we don't go. We need your lead. Oh, Lord God, help us to be a people of prayer. Just like we prayed over each room in the church yesterday, I pray we do that more often. Spend more time with you. And not only as a congregation gathered together, that too but as individuals meeting throughout the week, as people on the phone. May we have a burden to reach the lost with the gospel. Lord Jesus, you are the reason we are here. You are the reason that we live. And you are amazing, and for that reason, we come to you right now with these various prayer needs. We pray for Walt Kapler for continued comfort and care. I pray for Wendy Coy and Kevin and Katie and Ryan for comfort and care and Wally, her brother and family, and Karen, Wendy's sister and family. We pray for comfort for all the others who have lost, lost loved ones uh, recently or in the last year. Keep, keep, keep giving them your comfort. I pray for Adrian Wall's continued healing, and, 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 and I pray for Leslie Bloom's healing as well, healing her hip, and now um, one of her children, a little ill last night. I pray that she would be better quickly. I pray for Nick Gavolis healing his hip, allowing him to have that hip replacement, healing the gums from the gum graft. We pray for Isla Stein's continued healing and Sandy Mink as well on chemo, uh, chemo pills now. We pray for the family of Pat Amer, uh, for just, or his Amer, Amer, for comfort and care. Lord God, I cannot imagine that trial and that tribulation of finding your son dead on the floor. I pray for your peace upon them. I pray that he was a believer in you and is with you in heaven. And so I pray, Lord God, that the Holy Spirit would give them peace. Lord God, there are many other needs in the congregation. I don't know if I mentioned Diane Young again yet. I pray for Diane Young's healing. Heal the effects of the COVID and heal her cancer. Keep it at bay as well. We pray for today's offering. Please take it and use it for your glory and your purposes. Lord God, as we pray to Sunday school, I pray again that you would... Uh, be with all of our first responders today. Be with all those driving snow plows. I see our, our plows right there in the parking lot now. Keep them safe and alert and rested. We thank you for our first responders. We thank you for our military men and women, our police officers. It's a hard day and age to be a police officer, and I pray that you would give them respect. And, and, and Lord, it, for the military, keep them safe, comfort their family members. We pray for our country. Lord God, as I think it was yesterday, the Sanctity of Life March again. Um, we pray, Lord God, you guide our Supreme Court and guide our country. I pray that in time, abortion would be unthinkable. 
not just because of laws and legislation, but people would return to you as Lord and Savior. People would come to know you as Lord and Savior, and they would have a biblical worldview. Please, Lord, be glorified and exalted as we continue to worship you right now. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Continue to worship with how great thou art and with pastor talking and dealing with creation and the song you know the first two verses well the first one talks about creation the third verse talks about what God did for us sent Jesus Christ and the fourth verse talking about him coming again sums up just how great God is and we're going to do the first two verses back to back and then the chorus and then three and four and then the chorus and if you're able to stand with us as we worship the Lord realizing how great he is Continue to bless this service, Lord. 
for your glory, for your exaltation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, you'll see in your bulletin that uh, Bill Rotar was supposed to have special music today. And uh, we have... Uh, they threw me under the bus, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was Megan's fault. She's admitting it. Uh, we were practicing this song. This was supposed to be a congregational. And Megan's just stopped singing and was listening, and she just loved the harmony parts to it. She says that has to be a special music. So I hope it's as blessing to you as it was to Megan and, and to us. The wonder of it all. Amen. Thank you. What a wonderful song to uh, worship the Lord with. And obviously they did an amazing job. We're going to go to the sermon here, and I'm going to start down here, which you'll see why in a moment. There's no Juju Church today. Um, sorry, children. Um, but I thought I would let you help me. Uh, could you come up here, any kids that are willing? I know Mercedes and Abby are willing. I think Nicole's willing, too. Come up here and help me with something for a moment. I have an object lesson to lead us in. So I'm preaching a sermon series on, who can tell me? Go ahead. What? No, I'm not preaching a sermon series on Jenga. This is Jenga. It's a knockoff version. What's this sermon series on? You know? 
You don't know? I've been with you so long. Anybody know what my sermon series is on right now? Genesis being foundational to our faith, okay? And so I got this Jenga set. Um, Can one of you pick up those blocks? We're not going to need them all. Um, How would we set these up? Can you guys start? Go ahead, Nicole. How would we set them up? So you're putting two on the bottom for those that can't see, which is like all of you. And you want just two on the bottom? What do you guys think? Are there Mercedes, Abby? You think that there should be three on the bottom? Why? Why three on the bottom? It makes a better foundation. But what if I want to do it a different way? Let me see. Okay. Let's um, move over to the side a little bit so that people maybe on the camera or around them can share. So I want to do it differently. I want to put one block on the bottom like this. And then I want to stack on top of that. Will that work? Why won't this work? What if I want it to work? What if I believe it can work? Why are they going to? Oh, they did just fall over, didn't they? So I can't just kind of believe that it can work that way? Because why? They're going to fall over, but why are they going to fall over? Stronger foundation. So the bottom, the foundation needs to be better for the rest to go up, right? And what I'm trying to say is it's the same thing with our faith. It's the same thing with the Bible. Thank you so much for your help. You guys, you ladies can sit down now. You are really helpful. In Genesis chapters 1 through 11 are the foundation to our faith. And if we take one part out of it and we just say, you know, this part wasn't real, this part was just allegory. So it's like taking one block out of a building's foundation, okay? And we start tampering and we start saying, no, I don't want it to be this way. So then we take another block out. The rest of our faith can just crumble. And we're seeing that happen with our culture. We have seen that happen with our culture the last few hundred years. Foundation is critical. I have an illustration. If you want, turn to Genesis chapter 2 in your Bibles or on your electronic devices. And also, you might put your Bible there or a little, or a pen or a bookmark. And also turn to Exodus chapter 20. Those are the two key passages that we're going to look at. Exodus chapter 20 and Genesis chapter 2. Because today we're going to talk about the significance of the seventh day as consecrated. The seventh day, that's the Sabbath day. The seventh day, the Sabbath day, significant and consecrated. And that being foundational to faith, that being significant. Now, I'm not going to make the case that we're still bound by the Sabbath law now. It's the only one of the Ten Commandments not repeated in the New Testament. However, I do believe, though I'm not planning to preach on this, that the Sabbath principle is still important today. We do need a day of rest. So if you see me cutting my grass on a Sunday afternoon... I'm not breaking the Sabbath, (laughs) because the Sabbath would actually be Saturday anyways. (laughs) And the principle is still very important that we need a day of rest. We'll come back to that. But think about rest and work. Uh, uh, Chuck Smendahl writes this using the poem. He didn't make up the poem. Pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to look at the queen. Pussycat, pussycat, what did you there? I frightened a little mouse under her chair. Um... Megan just sent me a message that, yes, there is junior church. So, kids, you may go (laughs) to junior church. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Back to the poem. She must have thought uh, it's better for the kids to have more more age-appropriate instruction today. Back to this. Pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to look at the queen. Pussycat, pussycat, what did you there? I frightened a little mouse under her chair. Stupid cat. She had the chance of a lifetime. You guys just kid a cat. And I saw Morgan laughing when I said stupid cat. <laughs> she had the chance of a lifetime. All of London stretched out before her. Westminster Abbey, the British Museum, 10 Downing Street, Trafalgar Square, the House of Parliament, the Marble Arch in Hyde Park. She could have heard the London 
Philharmonic or scrambled up an old wooden lamppost to watch the changing of the guard. I doubt that she even cared she was in a, that she was within walking distance of St. Paul's Cathedral. She probably did not even realize it was a historic Thames rushing by beneath that big, rusty bridge. She scampered across, chasing more mice. After all, she didn't even scope out the queen as her majesty stood before her. Not this cat. She is such a mouseaholic. She can't stop the same old grind, even when she's in London. What a bore. There's an old Greek motto that says, you will break the bow if you keep it always bent. You'll break the bow if you keep it always bent, which being translated loosely from the original means, there's more to being a cat than tracking mice. Or there's more to life than hard work. I love that. Think about work and overwork and rest and ceasing from labor. Think about being tired. Imagine perfect rest. Imagine, really imagine what it's like to be rested. At the same time, rest is not the same as not working, right? We may rest while doing a hobby or reading a book. Or watching a sport, still at some point we must cease from our labor. I want to come back to that idea of rest and work and ceasing here in a little bit. But as I said, I'm in a sermon series on Genesis 1 through 11 being foundational to our faith. My theme today is the significance of the seventh day as consecrated. The significance of the seventh day as consecrated. From Exodus chapter 2, from Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, but starting, starting with Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And we're going to see first the Sabbath in Genesis. But as I think about significance, I had to think about Captain Jack Sparrow. He was in the Pirates of the Caribbean, as all of you know. Maybe you don't, but I'll tell you. And I thought about him because somebody messaged me a picture. It was a meme with writing on it a few weeks ago. And it set, had a picture of the Pirates of the Caribbean and Jack Sparrow with a Steelers helmet on his head. And the other pirates talking to him. And the pirates, on the, no, not the pirates, they're the English, the English soldiers. And they said, you're the worst excuse for a playoff team around. And Captain Jack Sparrow with the Steelers helmet on says, Oh, but you have heard of me. <laughs> and I think I messed up the joke. It actually says, you're the worst pirate, you're the worst playoff team I've ever heard of. And then, but you have heard of me. Significance. Significance. And obviously that's just a joke, of course, just to introduce humor, but significance. We see in Genesis chapters 1 through 11, these things are significant. That's why we've heard of them. That's why we know of them. That's why they're recorded in the Bible. That's why we must, we, 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 we can't tamper with them. They're foundational to our faith. They're foundational. And that's why we see them from Genesis chapter 2 to Exodus chapter 20 to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament and other places throughout the Bible. I want to begin talking about the Sabbath being set apart, sanctified, consecrated in Genesis. Then I want to show that in a, I want, I want to show that in another place in the Old Testament and then the New Testament. My goal, as I've already stated, and let me say it again, is not to show that we're bound by the Sabbath law now. I don't think that's the case. Just to be redundant, it's the only one of the Ten Commandments not repeated in the New Testament, but there's a reason for that, which you'll see by the end of this sermon. My goal is to show that Genesis matters. This passage matters. We cannot cut verses out of the Bible without that affecting other parts of the Bible. We will see that God uses Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, as the principle for the Sabbath command in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. That is amazing. We will see that in the New Testament, this idea is shown to be even greater in that the Sabbath in Genesis 2 is actually pointing to Jesus. 
is pointing to Jesus, that we have a greater Sabbath through our faith in Jesus. Someday Jesus will give us work without growing weary. But even right now, the book of Hebrews chapter 6 shows, as well as chapter 4 and other places, that even right now we have tasted of the Sabbath rest through Jesus our Savior. What did Jesus say? Come to you, all who are tired and weary, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. They were weary by trying to keep the Jewish law. They were weary of trying to atone for their sins. And what did Jesus do? He gave rest. Because we trust in him as Lord and Savior. We have faith in him. It's all about grace. Genesis chapter 2 is pointing to Jesus. Just like Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is the first messianic prophecy. We see these in the Old Testament. The whole Bible, the whole Bible is pointing to Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus. Wonderful passage in Luke 23. Jesus catches some of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They're walking. Jesus comes alongside. They don't recognize him. Maybe because of his glorified state. Maybe because he himself disguised himself. Maybe because of their grief and their mourning. They don't recognize him. They talk and they walk and they say, haven't you heard about everything going on in Jerusalem? And he kind of says, what are you talking about? You know, place. Let them tell him. And then eventually he sits down with them and he It says, he opens their minds. That's what it says. He opens their minds, showing that the Old Testament was about him. The Sabbath command is pointing to our rest in Jesus. We should actually read the Bible, so let's look at Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. That means he consecrated it. He, he made it holy. That means he set it apart. He sanctified it. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. We see in this passage that God is done creating. He's done. Then verse 2 shows that God finished working and he rested. In reality, this means that God ceased from creating. This is not God taking a nap. God does not grow tired or weary. God has unlimited power, unlimited energy, even more than a two-year-old. <laughs> you ever, ever seen a two-year-old or a three-year-old? They have unlimited power and energy, at least it seems like, right? God really does have unlimited power and unlimited, unlimited energy. He does not grow tired or weary. He ceases from creating. And this is showing that after six days, God's creation is complete. This is also setting an example for us that we need rest. We do not have unlimited power. We do not have unlimited energy. Look at verse 3. God blesses the seventh day. God makes the seventh day holy. God is saying that this is a different day. God consecrates the seventh day. God declares that the seventh day is sacred, holy. Now, this is not the commandment. The actual commandment does not come until something like three or 4,000 years later in Exodus chapter 20. So let's go there right now. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Moses is on the mountain. God is giving him the Ten Commandments. So imagine Moses there. God's giving him the Ten Commandments. He's to take them to the people. And this commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Now this is interesting. How does he... What does he hearken back to, so to speak? What does he refer back to for the Sabbath command? Here he says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. He used Genesis chapter 2 as kind of the example, the type pointing to the archetype, pointing to the Sabbath command right there. Now, so we see the Sabbath commandment here. And we see, remember the Sabbath day, which is the fourth commandment. Now, what's, what's interesting here, notice this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. Six days you shall labor. Some of us hear the Sabbath command, but not the labor command. 
He says, six days you shall work. Many today need to remember the work command. I think one thing going on in our culture today, one thing that's wrong in our culture, is we've lost the ability for hard work. There's a lot going on in our world right now. But bullies and bullying has always existed. But it used to be, kids would get bullied in school, and then they come home, and you don't have cyberbullying. It stops. You come home. It used to be they came home to a good family that would nurture them and guide them. It used to be, there was a great article in the Atlantic about this a few years ago called the, it was, I didn't like the title, something like the nuclear family was a mistake or something. didn't like the title. But the whole article was about how it's not really the nuclear family, mom, dad, and kids. Historically, it was mom, dad, and kids, and right down the road were the grandparents, and on the other way were the aunts and uncles and the cousins. They all lived around each other, and they all supported each other, and that's changed. But beyond that, you used to come home from school, and you had work to do. You worked on the farm. You actually worked alongside dad and maybe grandpa and maybe others. And when you, get, when you work, I don't know if you've experienced this. I certainly have. When you actually work, especially physical labor and sweat, you can work out a lot of emotions, too. Even the bullies had to stop because they had work to do. And the next day, you had to get up early to do work before breakfast. I know about it. I read about it in the Little House books. <laughs> in a real way, I read about it in Billy Graham's autobiography. If you read Just As I Am, it's in our library. My gosh, he had to get up at like 2.33 in the morning to go milk cows. They really did work. So some people need to read this command, even young adults, and maybe even older adults, and they need to remember to turn off the video games and go do some labor. I don't understand video games. I know it's kind of partially my generation. It seems like a total waste of time. But if you like it, more power to you. But we have to remember, actually, I don't think that's more power to you. I don't think there's any power in video games, sorry. But, but you do need to remember to work. That's what it says. Six days you shall labor. God is saying you labor. You have work to do. But God is saying you need to trust me with the Sabbath, and you need to set aside a day of rest. Because if you work seven days a week, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt your livestock. You're going to hurt your servants. You're going to hurt your family. And you're going to hurt everyone. And we know that today. Right? We know what happens with burnout without giving yourselves time for rest. And notice in this, in this Jewish command, he's saying, God is telling them, you aren't to make your servants work. You aren't to make your animals work. It's a day of rest for everyone. It's not you rest while you abuse others. No, it is a day of rest for everyone, but it's also work for everyone. And they're both modeled here, and they're both incredibly important. Six days you labor. The seventh day you cease from your labor. Now, later on, there will be more laws about this. And guess what? They are permitted to work to save a life. They are even permitted to work to save an animal's life that is stuck in a a ditch or something. God allowed that. It seems like in Exodus 20, we see the Ten Ten Commandments, and then the rest of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, they're all commentary on the Ten Commandments, case law on the Ten Commandments. Although Dr. Radelnik on Moody Radio often says what would happen is God gave them the Ten Commandments, and then they would sin again, so God would give them another commandment. And there was that too. There was something like 613 in the Old Testament. What does God do, though? What does he do here? He appeals to creation. In six days the Lord created, in the seventh he rested. In Deuteronomy 5.13 and following, Moses, inspired by God, restates the Sabbath command. And in that case, he refers back to their slavery in Egypt. But in this place, in Exodus 20, he refers back to creation. Now, this is what's important. If you're trying to define a word, One of the best ways to define the word is by context. One of the other best ways to define a word is to see how that word is used throughout the rest of a book, or in this case, the Bible. I read old books to my kids. Uh, We've been trying to go through Little Women. Um, We've gone through Little House books and Anne Anne, Anne of Green Gables and other books and um, Charlotte's Web, one of my favorites, and, and others. And you see, if you're reading books from 50 or 60 years ago, they use definitions differently than we do today. They will use queer quite a bit. And I'll have to emphasize my kids say, that means just strange in this context. Context matters a lot. 
cross-reference, correlation matters a lot. So look at this. In the creation account, in Genesis chapter 1, we see the word day repeated a lot. The Hebrew word day is yom, Y-O-M. I shared this last week, so you all know it, I know. And it's, it's yom, Y-O-M. Yom can be translated as a solar day. It can also mean a period of time and other things. But So what's the best way to understand what does it mean in the creation account? What does it mean in Genesis chapter 2? Remember the Sabbath day, the Sabbath yom. What does it mean? How do we translate that? How do we understand what that word means? Well, context, usually when yom is, 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 is in a sentence with morning and evening and things like that, it means a solar day. But what else can we do? Look at how the word yom is used in the rest of the Old Testament. And right here, in Exodus chapter 20, God is talking about a Sabbath day of rest. It's clear, right here, this is about one solar day of rest. Not a period of time, not anything else. One solar day of rest. And what does God do right here? He uses the same word for day, and he makes them think back to the creation account. Six days, six domes, the Lord made heaven and earth. In the seventh, he rested. This is why this is important. This is why Genesis chapters 1 through 11 are foundational to our faith. Right here, we see that idea here. We cannot tamper with one part of the Bible without it affecting other parts of the Bible. Now, we do need to know literary, literary devices, okay? You don't want to interpret the Bible in a wooden literalism that, that gets yourself caught. Words do mean different things in different places. Heaven can mean many different things, okay? And, and so the way Jesus might use heaven might be a little different than, than Genesis chapters 1 and 2. We need to know that. But right here, we are cross-referencing, we are correlating Genesis chapter 2 with Exodus chapter 20, and that's critical. Now look at the Sabbath in the New Testament. Colossians two sixteen and 17 says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. But look, look at why. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. He's saying this is pointing to Christ. One person writes, what Paul says here is remarkable. Tom Schreiner writes, for, the, for, for he lumps a Sabbath together with food laws, festivals like Passover and Newman's. All of these constitute shadows that anticipate the coming of Christ. And since Christ has now come... Observing the Sabbath is no longer a matter of obedience or disobedience. Rather, Paul says, let no one pass judgment on you. The author of Hebrews brings us closer to the heart of why the new covenant does not require a literal Sabbath rest. The author of Hebrews shows Christ's first coming did not abolish rest. Rather, it ushered in a deeper kind of rest than the Sabbath could ever offer. Hebrews 4, 9, and 10 says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. A Sabbath rest for the people of God. According to Hebrews 4, Israel's Sabbath always pointed forward to a far greater day, the still future day, when all creation will enter fully into the rest foreshadowed and promised in Genesis 2, 2 through 3. The very first seventh day, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, Hebrews 4, 9 says. The ultimate Sabbath rest is coming when God's people will enjoy work without toil, hearts without sin, and an earth without thorns. Yet, even now, Hebrews implies... We feel the first waves of the coming rest. In Christ, we have already tasted the powers of the age to come. Hebrews 6, 5, rest included. For the author writes, we who have believed enter the rest. Not will enter, but enter fully. Enter fully and truly now. We've already entered this rest through Christ, though we will enter more fully later on in the new heavens and new earth. So how do we enter that rest? Not mainly by putting aside our weekly labors for one day and seven, but by believing. We who have believed enter that rest. Faith in Jesus Christ brings the rest of the seventh day into every day. 
So again, we see the Sabbath of Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, referred to in other parts of the Bible. We can't tamper with Genesis chapter 2 and say this wasn't real or, you know, things like that. Or it's just allegory or just metaphorical without tampering with Hebrews and with other parts of the Bible. It's all pointing to Jesus. It's all pointing to rest through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and our Savior. I read the following. I did not write this. I smile when I read this from the newspaper. The world is too big for us. Too much going on. Too many crimes. Too much violence. Try as you will, you get behind in the race. It's an incessant strain to keep pace. You still lose ground. Science empties its discoveries on you so fast you stagger beneath them in hopeless bewilderment. The political world is news, seen, So rapidly, you're out of breath trying to keep pace with who's in and who's out. Everything is high pressure. Human nature can't endure it much more. Human nature can't endure it much more. Do you think that was from a newspaper today or yesterday? How many think that was from a recent newspaper? More hands. How many think it was from 50 years, within the past 50 years? Okay, a few. How many think it was from 150 years ago? Close. June 16th, 1833. 150 or more, actually more than 150 years ago. That was the good old days. And you don't have any idea, nor did I, this person writes, what the Boston Globe had as its headlines, November 13th, 1857. Three words. Energy crisis looms. 1857. The subheading said, World may go dark since whale blubber so scarce. You can't help but smile because everything has to do with perspective. For some, the good old days means what was simple and uncomplicated and beautiful and free of the horrors of our present times. Or was there ever a time like that? Was there ever a time simple? Was there ever a time without these trials and tribulations? That's why this Sabbath idea is pointing to Jesus' kingdom. It is pointing to the rest we have entered now knowing Jesus, but the rest we will fully enter in his kingdom. This author continues. He says, my good old days take me back to a world war where there were little markers on windows up and down the little street where I lived in Houston. And grieving parents peeled those little markers off when their son died in that war. The good old days would take you back to the time when horses died in the streets of New York because of cholera. The good old days were times in my father's era when cars couldn't be started from inside. You had to go outside and crank them. And you had to walk in rainy days on boggy streets because back then there weren't hard surfaces and beautiful freeways and roadways. One news commentator said it very well. It was Paul Harvey. He wrote, had the first product using electricity been the electric chair, we would all be afraid to plug in our toasters in the morning. It's how you look at it, isn't it? Well, the constant grind of life can get very difficult. And the Sabbath principle is clear that we need rest. But Genesis 2, pointing to Jesus and the rest we can have in Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. You did give us principle. You didn't need rest, but we definitely do need rest. We are not limitless. We need rest, uh, Lord God. We do not have unlimited power, energy, time. We need rest. And Lord God, help us to rest. But most of all, help us to rest in you. I'm sure, Lord God, there's some here or some watching online or listening later on on podcast that are trying to take care of their sin on their own. Constant burden. Trying to earn their way to heaven. And your word teaches us we cannot earn our way to heaven. But you paid our way to heaven. You died on the cross for our sins and rose again. We must trust in you as Lord and Savior. Lord God, if there's any listening who have not trusted, may today be the day where they put their faith in you. 
Maybe some have strayed and they need to rededicate their life to you. Maybe some have been believers, but they're not making you Lord of their life. May today be the day where they make you Lord of their life. And may whoever these people are tell you that in a simple prayer. Like this. Doesn't have to be the same. But something similar to, Lord Jesus, I confess I've sinned and missed your perfect standard. I believe in you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again. Today, Lord, I'm trusting in you as a Lord and Savior. Today, Lord, I'm committing my life to you. Please come into my life and help me to live for you. Help us all, Lord. We cannot do this on our own. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit. We need to be connected to the vine, as John 15 says, is you. We need to walk with you. We need to remain in you, John 15, 4. We need to abide in you. For apart from you, John 15, 5, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to conclude with a song we introduced a few weeks ago, Jesus, Your Name. If you're able to stand with us. Talking about who he is. Jesus, your name is power. Jesus, your name is might. Jesus, your name will break every stronghold. Jesus, your name is life. Jesus, your name is power. Jesus, your name is mine. Jesus, your name will break every stronghold. Jesus, your name is life. Your name is healing. Jesus, your name is healing. Jesus, your name gives sight. Jesus, your name will break every stronghold. Jesus, your name is life. His name is holy. And Jesus, your name is holy. Jesus, your name brings light. Jesus, your name above. Jesus, your name is life. Let us pray. Jesus, your name truly is life. Lord, everything that we have need of is summed up in the name of Jesus. If we need healing, we go to you. If we need comfort, we go to you. We go to the one that is holy, the one that is the creator. There is nothing, Lord, that we go through that you are not aware of. Lord, we're so thankful that you are with us in the midst of whatever, whatever our situation may be. Lord, may, whether it's facing an illness, whether it's facing a job loss, not knowing how to pay bills, Whatever the situation is, you are with us. We're so thankful for that, Lord, that we give you praise, and glory, and honor. Lord, I pray your blessings upon each and every one in this place today. Lord, we pray your traveling mercies as we go home. Lord, we pray your safety as we go through the parking lot. Lord, may you be exalted and glorified in our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. your name brings light. Jesus, your name